Hey everybody, it's Dr. Yola. I had the opportunity of sitting with Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman today as she wanted to communicate with her constituents about coronavirus. And I figure if the residents of New Jersey had the benefit of the information, why not you? So the first question that I often get asked is, what is coronavirus? I think the better question to ask is, what are coronaviruses? As coronaviruses are a collection of viruses that cause a variety of symptoms from the most severe and extreme being severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and Middle East respiratory syndrome, MERS, to the very basic common cold. Coronavirus is actually the second most common cause of the common cold, just second to rhinovirus. So for the most part, coronavirus causes cold symptoms, but in two instances, it can cause more severe symptoms. One, when we contract one of the coronaviruses from animals. So there are certain coronaviruses that only animals get an infection from. But when humans come into contact with urine, animal urine, feces, or blood, we run the risk of developing an infection. The second way in which we are exposed to novel coronavirus, which is why this one was called novel coronavirus 2019, is when there is slight genetic change to the virus itself. We see this every single year with the flu virus. It's the reason why we have to give a flu vaccine annually. The flu virus changes just slightly every single year, which results in us developing flu-like symptoms because our bodies, it changes just enough for our bodies not to be able to recognize it, fight it off, and prevent us from getting ill. With this particular virus, coronavirus 2019, the suspicion is that it was based on animal contact and transmission to a human, which then caused this epidemic. The second question that I get asked is, what should we be doing now? The first thing I would say to do is not to panic. As scary as it is, and I'll admit when I listen to news stories, it makes me a little concerned as well, but the first step is not to panic and to truly understand what your risk is, right? So there's several risk factors for acquiring coronavirus and significant symptoms from coronavirus. One, have you traveled to a high risk area? Those five countries include China, Japan, South Korea, Iran, and Italy. The second risk factor is have you been in contact with someone who has been a confirmed positive coronavirus case? That doesn't mean that there isn't community transmission because remember, most coronaviruses, including this one, only cause mild symptoms. So there are a lot of people with coronavirus 2019 with mild symptoms, and then they are passing that within the community to cause some of these community acquired cases that we now see. So although you may not have a risk of having a direct contact with coronavirus or having traveled, there's still mild risk when we are in contact day to day. And we'll talk a little bit later about how to protect yourself and prevent yourself from getting an infection. The other two areas of risk, particularly once you've acquired coronavirus 2019, are our seniors and those who have chronic medical conditions. We know that both of those categories of folks have increased risk of severe illness and death. So it's very important that we protect our seniors and those who have chronic medical conditions. Now, what do we do to protect ourselves to prevent coronavirus? A lot of this is basic good hygiene, things we should be doing every single day, like, ah, washing your hands. That is the top way in which to decrease your risk of transmitting and acquiring coronavirus 2019. Water and soap is my first recommendation. You want to sing happy birthday to your hands at least twice to appropriately have enough time to make sure you've removed all bacteria and viruses from your hands. Hand sanitizer is a second best approach, really because a lot of people only apply the hand sanitizer to the palms of their hands. If you're gonna use hand sanitizer, get in between those fingers on the backs of your hands in the same way that you would apply soap and water, all right? So washing your hands is going to be critical. The next thing that you want to do to protect yourself and others is to sneeze and cough in the crease, right like that. Not over the shoulder, clearly not in the hands, but in the crease. What that does is it decreases the amount of respiratory droplets that are spread when you sneeze and cough. And that's how coronavirus is transmitted, through respiratory droplets, the little spittles that fly when people cough and sneeze. And the more we're able to cough into the crease, the less likely we will spread coronavirus. The third thing is to try to avoid surfaces. Not everyone is washing their hands the way that they should. So I'm talking doorknobs, elevator buttons, grocery cart handles, all of those things. If you can avoid contact, excellent. If you can't, Use your forearm, use your knuckle to push the, uh, the uh, elevator button, use a paper towel. Like these are things that I do 
regularly, but it makes sense to put them in practice for everyone. Be very cautious of phones. We usually offer to take people's pictures when they're struggling to take a selfie. The phone is one of the dirtiest items you can touch. Make sure you're washing your hands after you grab onto someone's phone. The next thing you wanna do is to try to avoid contact to your face. The way that this virus is being transmitted is through mucous membranes, right? So if I touch on something where someone has sneezed and they didn't use the crease to cover, and now those respiratory droplets are sitting on the grocery store basket handle, then I touch my eyes, my nose, or my mouth, then I have increased my risk of acquiring the infection. So you want to try to either avoid or wipe things down and then try to avoid contact with your face. For some of us in very social professions, politicians, healthcare providers, we like to shake hands. This is the season of avoiding the uh, handshake and the kissing of the babies. Instead, this is the season of elbow, fist bumps, maybe even a hug, but first ask permission, of course, um, in terms of decreasing our risk of transmitting the infection. And then lastly, but most importantly, if you are sick, please stay home. I know I sit in a position of entitlement having paid sick leave, so it's easy for me to say, but even for those of us who do not have paid sick leave, if you are sick, it makes sense to allow your body to recover and to restore. If you don't, you'll end up costing yourself and probably having more sick days than you had anticipated because the more you push yourself in illness, the more your body is going to want to recover and you'll end up having to take more sick days than you had anticipated. It also helps protect your colleagues, your customers, your clients, your patients. So make sure that you're doing those six things to protect yourself and to protect others. Speaking of protection, everyone's rushing to Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, eBay, you name it. Everyone's in a rush to get a mask, right? So let's talk about that for a second. Two different masks, surgical mask and an N95 mask. The surgical mask is used to protect people from passing the virus when they sit in waiting rooms at healthcare professionals' offices. You go to the emergency department or your doctor's office, they screen you, you tell them you have fever, cough, and shortness of breath, they're going to give you a mask. That's to protect everyone else in the waiting room from allowing those respiratory droplets to spread out when you cough or sneeze. It does not protect otherwise healthy individuals from coronavirus 2019. If anything, it increases your risk because the mask doesn't have a seal and then the respiratory droplets are actually able to get inside the mask and you end up creating a very concentrated space for the respiratory droplets to exist. In terms of the N95 mask, that's a mask that health professionals use in order to protect ourselves from highly infectious respiratory diseases like tuberculosis. But we have to undergo what's called fit testing. It's when we put the mask on and then the seal, the tightness of the seal is assessed to make sure that it's so tight that respiratory droplets, even the tiniest, don't pass underneath the mask. Lay people don't undergo those respiratory fit tests. So it makes no sense to rush out and buy boxes of masks when you're not going to be able to use them appropriately. If anything, one, again, it increases your risk of infection because those respiratory droplets get under the mask and increase your risk of infection. But it also puts doctors and other healthcare professionals like myself at jeopardy when we cannot get the mask because they're sold out across the country. Let's talk about symptoms. When you develop fever with a temperature of greater than 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, a cough and shortness of breath it's probably time to see your clinical health professional. But that would be the case regardless of what's happening in terms of this epidemic. You would go see your healthcare provider if you felt short of breath. And let's talk about what that means. Short of breath means it feels difficult to breathe. It's as if you haven't worked out for months and then you decide to run a 5K. You would feel winded. It would be hard for you to catch your breath. That's shortness of breath. If you feel that in the context of fever and a cough, it's time to see your doctor. Whether you're concerned about coronavirus or not, we need to make sure that your lungs are healthy. The caveat being for children. Children aren't necessarily gonna tell you they feel short of breath. Instead, what you wanna do is lift up their shirts, look at their chest and their abdomen to see if they're sucking in at their belly. In the same way that we suck in when we try to look skinny on the beach, children will do that automatically when they're working hard to breathe. So if your child has fever and cough, and you want to assess whether or not they're working hard to breathe, lift up their shirt. And also make sure when you bring them in to see a healthcare professional that they do the same. Once you present to a healthcare professional, several things are going to happen. They're gonna screen you. They're gonna ask you questions like, have you traveled to a high risk country? Do you know of anyone who has been tested positive for coronavirus within your space? You'll answer those questions, likely be given one of those surgical masks, and then you will be uh, seen and evaluated for coronavirus. 
There are no on-the-spot tests, regardless of what the administration says. We have not yet had available on-the-spot testing in the same way that we test for the flu or for strep. It's in the making. We're not sure when we'll get it. There is speculation that we'll have it within the next one to two weeks. We don't know. But for right now, what will happen is a doctor will swab a Q-tip in your nose, do what's called a nasopharyngeal swab, send that off, and in four to five days, we will be able to confirm whether or not you have coronavirus 2019. The use of a on-the-spot flu test is not appropriate. All that does is tells me whether or not you have the flu. Some folks are saying, oh, well, if it tests positive for the flu, then it means you might also have coronavirus. No, if it tests positive for the flu, you could have the flu or you could have coronavirus. There are some similarities, but that does not, a positive test for flu does not translate to a positive test for corona. Right now, it still requires four to five days. So it's important to understand that when you go in. We're not testing everybody. You may have the risk factors, you may not. Part of the importance of going to see your healthcare professional is that even without risk factors, if you present with significant symptoms, it's really up to the healthcare professional's discretion, or at least it should be, to be tested. If you have those three symptoms and you're very concerned, make sure you advocate for yourself so that you can know what your risk is, all right? Um, if you come and see me with cough, you don't have fever, you don't have shortness of breath, I'm not testing you for coronavirus. I'm just putting it out there for all of my patients who may be seeing this. Then, if you do test positive, there is no medication for it. Some folks are using Tamiflu as a means to treat coronavirus. I would say that that's an inappropriate treatment. One, because that medication was designed specifically to treat the flu. So we do not know whether or not it will be effective in treating coronavirus 2019. Um, it's usually symptomatic care. We wanna make sure that we control any discomfort that you have, fever that you may be dealing with, and certainly assess you for something like pneumonia. And clearly, if you have pneumonia, you will be appropriately treated. It. Once you're discharged home, if you test positive, you will be expected to undergo what's called self-isolation. That means you are in your home for at least two weeks to one, make sure that you recover well, but also to decrease the risk of transmitting it to others. We now know that at least two weeks have to go by before you are no longer contagious. So that lends me to uh, the one of the last things that I get asked is, how should I prepare in terms of quarantine? If schools get locked down, businesses get locked down, should I have months supplies of water, toilet tissue, toilet tissue, uh, paper towels, etc.? What I would say is anticipate the need to be in your house for two weeks if you end up acquiring coronavirus. Make sure that you have at least a two week supply of your prescription medications, tissues, food, all of those things. Now keep in mind that you can still get a lot of that stuff delivered, but you also run the risk of your Instacart driver getting uh, the bug, right? So just anticipate that, but there's no need to run out and get masks, months supplies of food, water, etc. There are excellent resources for additional information. I know the media, we're in a sensationalistic society right now. The media wants to report all the doom and gloom. So be mindful of how many clicks you put in the internet in terms of the reading of those scary stories. I would refer you to academic institutions in your state and your state health departments. Those two places are going to have trusted evidence-based information. And clearly the CDC, as it updates its website, will also have important information. We are in good hands. We have excellent public health systems, phenomenal um, healthcare professionals to take care of you. It's a very scary time as a doctor, as a mommy. Um, I do have concerns, but I trust that our systems are in place to be able to handle this and handle it well. We survived SARS, we survived H1N1, and we did it remarkably well. I know we will do that for this as well. I'll make sure to keep you updated as I hear more information. Uh, so stay connected with Dr. Yola. Thank you. Dr. Yola out.